Well, it's my real pleasure to welcome Veena Srivasavan from the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and Environment to the Water Underground Talks. Veena, how did you first develop a passion for water? Firstly, thanks, Tom, for inviting me to be part of these talks, and it's a real pleasure to be chatting. Um, I think my interest started uh, towards the end of my undergraduate uh, degree in physics when I realized that I didn't want to spend the rest of my life uh, doing physics, but I really wanted to do something that would be more um, socially relevant, it felt like at the time. And um, during my undergraduate thesis, two of my advisors decided for some strange reason to take a, a not very interesting undergraduate to the villages of Maharashtra. And they took me to a watershed called Raligan Siddhi, which is now very famous, but at that time in the, in the early 90s, it was a very little known watershed, which had practiced this experiment of stopping rainwater and uh, allowing it to recharge, and, there, and thereby had completely transformed uh, the villages uh, around and the farming incomes of the people that lived there. Uh, and so I thought that was interesting. I didn't completely absorb the implication of it at the time. And so I went off, I got a master's from the US and came back to India, and I actually joined the energy sector. And uh, a couple of years of working for what was essentially big energy companies made me kind of go back to where I had started my journey and realized that my aptitude is much better suited for working on public commons problems and access issues rather than uh, for what I was doing at the time, which is running models for big energy companies. And so I think that was my initial shift back to water. And then of course, once you start kind of going to the field, seeing conditions and then going back and forth between theory and, and practice, you realize that what we don't understand is so much and there's just so much more to be learned that uh, I think that fuels your passion and kind of keeps one going. Um, yeah. yeah, that, that uh, really aligns with uh, how you are today in the world as well. It's always wonderful to see the first, first roots of that. Um, and I would love to hear a little bit more about, about you, about how your personality or your personal interests make you a better scientist, in your opinion. Yeah, so I mean, I think it's, uh, it's right to be honest saying I'm not uh, a natural scientist, I really practice interdisciplinary water research. Mm -hmm. And I always joke that my, uh, my background is as mixed as it possibly can. I mean, I started off with physics, I kind of moved into interdisciplinary water sciences, I work across the science policy practice uh, uh, barrier a lot. And so I think that uh, I think in some ways, um, it, it, my personality must be a little bit of a rebel on one hand, because I think that I don't seem to ever seem settle down in one comfortable niche and always I'm trying to push boundaries. Uh, but I think that it suits me very well because I really feel kind of that's where the excitement lies and that's what's kind of driven me. It, I, in one hand, on one hand, it feels like a harder path because you never fit into any one community. On the other hand, it also feels much more exciting because you're playing an active role in cross fertilization of ideas. So. I, I didn't, wouldn't have described myself this way, but I think that the role suits me very well. And, and it's a role that, I, um, that I've learned to enjoy. Wow, that's wonderful. Yeah, and can you um, say just a little bit more, you, you noted it there about cross-fertilization, but can you say a little bit more about the center you're running now and how your work um, impacts uh, the broader world beyond uh, academia? Absolutely, thanks so much for asking. So I uh, started a center called the Center for Social and Environmental Innovation within A3 about a year uh, ago. And one of the reasons was that we realized that a lot of the science we were practicing wasn't making it into the practitioner community. And there was still a very big gap between the kinds of scientific research and the kinds of scientific data that were, uh, was being analyzed and put out and what the practitioner community was needing in terms of being able to solve problems on the ground more effectively. And so, I think once we started looking and we have a wonderful team uh, right now, and once we started collectively digging deeper, we realized that there were very, very specific gaps. Uh, some of the gaps are really in answering questions that we don't know enough about, but others are questions that we know the answers to, but the, the knowledge lies fragmented in many people's heads. And there's an important role in synthesizing that knowledge and bringing it together. And then it's also an important role in being able to communicate that synthesized knowledge and package it in a way that practitioners on the ground can actually use it and absorb it. 
So I would say that uh, my role still stays in the knowledge production area, but it's going beyond just as creating new forms of knowledge to also synthesizing and communicating it in forms that can be used in, in policy and practice. Vina, I would also love to hear um, what is the most influential paper for you in your learning about uh, groundwater. Thanks for asking that. So I think that uh, the groundwater budget myth, why hydrogeologists model uh, by John Braderhoft uh, in, groundwater, uh, in the journal Groundwater in 2005, really brought, uh, changed the way I think about groundwater, partly because uh, it made me realize that in countries like India, where 70, 80% of our, uh, our uh, drinking water and, and irrigation come from groundwater, um, needing to look at ground and surface water in a more integrated way uh, is much, much more important. And that was not the way groundwater is being regulated. And so it really was an eye opener to really start looking at ground and surface water as an integrated resource. Wonderful. Thank you. I've thought a lot about that paper as well. Um, so I hope to have conversations about that someday. Wonderful. Awesome. Well, I look forward to hearing more. Your talk is entitled very subtly, uh, Solving the Water Groundwater Crisis. So we'll move over to that and, and we'll look forward to hearing more about uh, your practice and, and your applied research. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. So I, uh, I think, you know, with no lack of ambition, I decided to call my talk Solving the Groundwater Crisis, um, because why not? And I think that um, it's well recognized that groundwater is declining at an alarm rate, alarming rate uh, in many regions of the world. Um, parts of India, parts of um, uh, the Western Arab United States, um, uh, South Africa, parts of Northern China, and, uh, and so on. And I think that when we ask the question, why is it that the crisis, despite having been well recognized and documented, continues to persist? Why are we not able to solve the crisis? I think that it's surprisingly hard and there are many, many different steps to the process. So I would say, you know, the first step is of course, you need to know where the zones of depletion are. Um, for at, in the zones of depletion, you need to know how much water do we have and how much are we currently using? Um, you want to be able to set a water budget to say how much should we be using beyond which we would, would go into um, a further decline. Um, and finally, you want to set some kind of regulations to stay within that budget. And I think that most people would agree that some version of this um, is, is necessary. I deliberately use the word water instead of groundwater because as we all know, uh, ground and surface water are connected. And so if you're talking about uh, addressing the groundwater crisis, you do need to think about ground and surface water as an integrated resource. Now, uh, let's just look at the first bit of this, which is knowing, locating the zones of depletion and then figuring out how much we have uh, in terms of the annual, annual renewable resource and then how much we're actually abstracting. Um, I think the first problem that we have, and this is now in much of the developing world, is that we just don't have enough monitoring well densities. Uh, monitoring well densities are low compared to um, the Western world. Um, I think any groundwater scientist would know that they lack crucial information often on which depths are being screened. And often therefore you have wells which are at one in a hundred square kilometer density maybe, but they are because they've been um, constructed at different periods of time, uh, they are at different depths and they're, um, they're often screening different uh, layers of the aquifer. Um, and in contrast, abstraction well densities are extremely high. Sometimes you can have 15, 20, 30 uh, wells per square kilometer, extraction wells uh, per square kilometer, which is an extremely high density. Um, and you'd see a lot of this in countries like India. And so you have this great mismatch between um, the, the, the resolution at which your cones of depression are forming and the resolution at which you're actually monitoring the data. And often even if the monitoring well data is capturing information on which aquifer is being screened and we all understand as groundwater scientists that different aquifers uh, may, uh, may have very, very different um, groundwater heads. And, but if that crucial information is missing from the public domain, then often there's a tendency to just um, to combine all of that, creating kind of almost uh, odd patterns that can't easily be explained. And then we are putting those into regional groundwater models and often then coming up with spurious results. Um, this gets even more complicated in fractured rock systems. 
Um, in India, at least, a lot of uh, a third of India consists of these kinds of crystalline fractured rock systems. And fractured rock systems have this problem of you can you can have uh, perched water tables or water levels can be hyperlocal, where wells which are very very close to each other, uh, depending on whether they tap the same fracture system or not, could show completely different well uh, levels. You could even see a well a hundred feet well which has been continuously productive for twenty years right next to a thousand feet bore well which hasn't uh, hasn't yielded water and has been abandoned. And so, under these circumstances, the question then arises. What does a groundwater level mean? What does a regional groundwater level mean? And how do you then appropriately aggregate to get a more complete picture uh, given the relatively low monitoring well densities that we have? Um, and the third problem is often interpreting the data, as I said, can be quite complicated. Um, and the combination of this low monitoring density and rapid depletion and the kind of hyperlocal groundwater levels that we often see can lead to survival bias problems, where um, you have a water table which is tapping uh, different fracture system, uh, uh, fracture networks, as I talked about. But then, when the water table begins to drop um, as groundwater is exploited, um, different wells, some of the monitoring wells might dry up, others might tap different fracture systems and show um, uh, very, very different water levels. And you can often have the situation of wells which are next to each other showing a water level that differs by 100 meters. Um, the other problem is that often the dry monitoring wells get dropped out of the database. And uh, you only therefore have uh, the monitoring wells which have continuous long-term records uh, tapping certain hyperlocal systems. But then because you have such low monitoring well densities, it creates what we call a survival bias problem where you're actually only interpreting those you perched, um, uh, perched aquifer uh, systems as being representative of the entire regional groundwater table. Um, so it's, I think the, the question then arises that when you have situations of rapid groundwater depletion um, in, in, in complete data, but you still, these are the places in the world that you most urgently need to, um, to monitor and quantify groundwater, both in terms of abstraction, as well as in terms of availability and, and, and the rate of depletion, how do you go about doing that? What different data sets could we use? How do we use data more innovatively and, um, and, and yet use it in a robust way that we can actually get to some of these crucial questions? And I, I just like to say that it's ironic sometimes that we, on one hand, talk about a data revolution where we, the, on one hand, the world is exploding with new forms of data. And we talk about the amount of data being created in the last two years being more than the amount of data that was created in all of history before that. So on one hand, we talk about this explosion of data and the data revolution. On the other hand, we talk about data scarcity and the inability to answer certain basic questions. And I think the first question that I'd like to pose for discussion to students uh, watching the video is how do we think about this more creatively? How do we, how do we, we can't go back in history. We don't have a time machine. We can't go back and put in new abstraction wells. So how do we then go about trying to recreate uh, decline and then be able to do so in a manner that would actually lead to problem solving? So to get back to my question of addressing the groundwater uh, crisis, I'm gonna talk about now the second part of it, which is actually setting a water budget and then getting people to set regula uh, uh, being able to set regulations to stay within that budget. Um, uh, as I said before, groundwater is depleting. And not surprisingly, if you look at the patterns of where groundwater depleting is depleting, it's the arid and semi-arid and hyper-arid parts of the world where groundwater is depleting fastest because potential evapotranspiration far exceeds uh, the available moisture. And therefore, there's a tendency for people to to pump water in the dry season for protective irrigation. So it's not surprising that there is a coincidence between groundwater depletion and, the, and aridity. But I, often the, the, the response that I get from um, a lot of students and scholars who are not familiar particularly with developing world conditions is, well, why don't you just stop groundwater extraction or why don't you tax it? And that would send the right incentive and farmers would then stop pumping. But I think it's important to realize that that groundwater is not just a resource. It's actually the only means of livelihood for millions and in fact, hundreds of millions of farmers um, in, in, in Africa and, uh, and, and South Asia. 
And uh, therefore, to overnight say that you should just stop groundwater extraction, it simply isn't politically viable. I mean, if it's a democracy, farmers can vote and they're going to vote out anybody who's going to try and increase groundwater prices, even if they very, very clearly and acutely understand the dangers of groundwater depletion. Most farmers do understand this, they're not stupid, but they also don't have um, alternative ways of, of, of approaching the problem. So um, often in India, and this is one of the reasons why the watershed development story that I started off with at the very beginning is so compelling, is that it's a very much a bottom up way of getting communities to recognize and, uh, and solve the problem bottom up instead of using a one size all top down uh, regulation, which hasn't succeeded, to be honest. So um, what's the problem with bottom up uh, regulations? And, and I think the big problem that we hear from practitioner communities on the ground who've been trying for years to be able to do it is that it's easy to bring a community when you're expanding the pie, right? When you're putting in structures to harvest more water, you're expanding the pie, it's easy to build consensus around that. It's much harder to build consensus around limit, limiting the pie and saying that we now have to live within this slightly expanded pie. And that's where the challenge comes in. Because when we look at uh, the kinds of challenges or the kinds of approaches that practitioners on the ground use, they are often intervening at the plot level. So they are going to farmers and saying, we'll build a farm bund, we'll build um, a, use label, laser leveling on your plot so you can get more access to moisture uh, and, and or you can have a check dam or you can have a farm, farm pond and capture more of, more of rainfall so you can use it in the dry season. And these kinds of plot level in, in interventions which end up expanding access to water do extremely well. The challenge is then that you, it doesn't help you stay within the, 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 the resource that's available. And so you still have a problem of abstracting too much. And so one of the big problems that, we, that most communities on the ground face is how do we get residents who understand in some way that groundwater is a problem and the next generation may not have access to it. How do you get them to see the common pool resource? How do you essentially render the invisible visible? Um, and you have to do that in a way, not just by saying what's the total amount of water available and how much are you over abstracting, but also helping them understand and uh, by highlighting inequities in access, because there are large farmers and small farmers and there are uh, typically half of the farmers don't have any access to water at all, they're rain fed. And basically if only you were able to show them what the, what the amount of water in the common pool resources, who is getting how much, and then be able to have them evolve uh, norms that they would adhere to as a community, uh, that's the only way you're going to be able to solve the problem bottom up. Um, so the, the last question that I would like to leave the students with is how do you make the invisible visible? How do you render um, the, the common pool resource at community scales where, where enforcement is actually possible, how do you render it uh, uh, the invisible visible so that you're able to then achieve these the evolution of norms bottom up? Um, I'll stop there, thank you. Yeah, so Veena, thank you very much for uh, the talk. I loved hearing about groundwater commons and data in India. And I'm sure uh, our students and students around the world will really enjoy thinking about and engaging with your questions. So thank you for uh, your time and, and uh, presenting in uh, Water Underground Talks. Thank you for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure.